Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Today on The Big Picture, we have a rather unusual story to tell. It is an important story, one that has truly revolutionized military training in the United States Army. Yet this is a story that I'm quite sure very few of you know very much about. What gives here? Conti, Lee, Rapita, Erie. Please pardon this intrusion on the big picture, ladies and gentlemen. But it's time that you, the people of America, knew the truth about the aggressor nation. Now, I don't know how long my men can hold this station, so I must be brief. My name is Captain Damolk, 3rd Aggressor Army, member Circle Trigon Party. I am sure that you of the television audience are completely unaware of this. But listen. These are the facts. Ever since the fall of 1946, the American Army has been at war with the forces of the Circle Trigon Party. Now, during this decade, large areas of the continental United States have been liberated by our forces. Because we have been so successful, you, of course, have been kept from the facts. But now, with the capture of the big picture, the Circle Trigon side of the story can at last be told. And we have prepared a short documentary film showing the liberation of the United States to date. I think you're going to find it interesting. The aggressor nation came into existence at the end of World War II. With the formation of the Circle Trigon Party and the Aggressor Armed Forces. In the fall of 1946, our aggressor armies, aided by many sympathizers, liberated the Antilles chain of islands and the Panama Canal. The fighting continued, our forces slowly but steadily consolidating one area after another. In 1947, Florida and portions of Georgia and North and South Carolina were liberated by the aggressor forces. While to the North, we were successful in New England and in the St. Lawrence River area. In 1948, an airhead was established in Tennessee and then unfortunately lost to superior United States forces. 1949, the Hawaiian Islands and the strategic Aleutian Islands just south of Alaska, liberated. 1950, some territory given up to consolidate our gains. Strength built up to meet new attacks upon the liberated areas. Nineteen fifty one. Amphibious operations against South Carolina successful. Charleston Falls. 1952, Texas liberated. 1953, most of New York State liberated. 1954, part of the West Coast liberated. 1955 and 1956, action continued on all fronts. Washington tried the big lie technique. But at present, the aggressor holds these key areas in the continental United States. And so you see, the aggressor armies have met with considerable success wherever they have turned. But we cannot afford to rest on past glories. As long as there is an American army in existence, we will be at war with that army. 
At this very moment, somewhere in the United States, American soldiers are locked in combat with the soldiers of the aggressor nation. I see we have established television contact with aggressor headquarters somewhere deep in the heartland of America. We take you there now for a first-hand report. This is Lieutenant Titanage at aggressor army headquarters. In this sector of the front, the current action has lasted almost three weeks now. Our general officers have decided the time has come for a knockout blow. The entire aggressor force will strike the American positions right here. But for a first-hand report of this forthcoming action, I will turn you over to our television reporter directly in the battle zone. This is Lieutenant Trieta in the aggressor battle zone. The word has just reached us of the forthcoming attack. This is the moment we've been waiting for. All is ready. For weeks now, the buildup has been underway. These tank reinforcements arrived only yesterday. They will see action before today is out. They are powerful persuaders in our efforts to liberate this country. But we have other forms of persuasion too. Modern warfare uses a lot of psychology. If the US troops have any sense, they will heed the good advice given here. With these pamphlets, for the first time, they will learn the truth about the war. It is time that they were told. It is time for them to put down their arms and permit themselves to be liberated. Perhaps these leaflets will make the battle easier for both sides. We have some other interesting persuaders. Listen as aggressor Annie chats with her American friends. Hello, boys. I have some good news for you. Three passes through our lines will soon be floating down from heaven for you. Use them. We are not really enemies but friends. So let's get together. Come on over and see me real soon. Meanwhile, our aggressor forces are not idle. While Annie has the attention of the American troops, our aggressor forces are about to launch the attack. Through the night, our forces move against a weak spot in the American defensive. We of the aggressors pride ourselves on being able to strike quickly, suddenly, where least expected. By night and by day, our highly mechanized army is always on the go. The final approach of the infantry is on foot. We know that our aggressor soldiers are superior to any American soldiers, for they are aggressors. Concealment and camouflage are our specialties, and we use many more automatic weapons than any army in the world. While other units prepare for the attack, reserves dig in to receive the expected American counterattack. No American tanks will pass on this road. We've planned this operation completely. And no American soldiers will remove the anti-tank emplacements which we have so carefully prepared. This is the final step. When our positions are completely guarded by mines, We'll be ready. Tanks move up. Positions are manned.
artillery is ready. H hour. Aggressor is victorious. Everywhere the Americans are pushed back or captured. Now, let me switch you to the parade ground of Aggressor headquarters for more first-hand news of the victory. This is Lieutenant Titanage at the parade ground just outside Aggressor headquarters. The news of our victory has elated the high command. A holiday has been declared. And right now, the headquarters troops are about to pass in review, celebrating just one more instance of Aggressor invincibility. It has been a great day for the armies of the Aggressor nation. Turn you to the big picture studio and Captain Demo. That's right. I am Captain Demo, Aggressor Forces, but I'm also Captain Kenneth Evans, United States Army. In fact, all Aggressor personnel are in the U.S. Army, but with a very special mission. Our job is to create as realistic a maneuver enemy as possible, so that combat training will approach the feeling of actual combat. We aggressors are really just a great big training aid, the biggest the Army has. At the close of World War II, a board of 100 combat experienced American generals was formed to recommend training policies for the future. Out of these recommendations came the aggressor concept of a maneuver enemy. The United States Army Aggressor Center was formed at Fort Riley, Kansas, and the mission was threefold. First, to provide a realistic enemy for maneuver training. Second, to provide realistic situations for intelligence training. And third, to make sure that all American soldiers are aware that any future enemy will look and act differently from what he is accustomed to. Perhaps at the Aggressor Center, Fort Riley, Kansas, we can give you a clearer picture of just what the aggressor concept is. In this limestone building, the whole aggressor army is housed. Not in the flesh, but on paper. Let's go inside. Recognize this room and these people? This is aggressor headquarters. That's the high command. This is where the aggressor plans his strategy. 
You see, every maneuver held by the United States Army is based on a realistic situation. The aggressor holds certain territory, and the U.S. holds other territory. Both have certain objectives, and both try to achieve them. The resulting mock battle, therefore, has a true basis in reality. The realism concept is carried even further. Remember when we said that the whole aggressor army was kept here? Well, there's a part of it right there on that table. The cards contain information about various aggressor army units. They specify the type of unit, the number of men assigned to it, and even the names of the senior officers. When aggressor prisoners are taken, such information can be invaluable in determining the disposition and strength of the maneuver enemy. There is one thing more that intelligence officers must keep in mind. The aggressor doesn't fight like the U.S. Army. His tactics and strategy are a composite of those from all the armies of the world. Given the same situation, he won't react in the same way that American forces would. In addition, the aggressor emphasizes infiltration and guerrilla actions. These differences make for a realistic maneuver enemy. This, then, is one of the functions of the men here at the aggressor center to plan the tactics and strategy the aggressor army will employ in any forthcoming maneuver. But in any maneuver, there are real aggressor soldiers moving according to the prearranged strategy. Who are they? They are American soldiers who have been chosen to play the part of the aggressor for the duration of the maneuver. However, they receive considerable training in the aggressor concept just prior to the maneuver. Providing the personnel to train these potential aggressor soldiers is another one of the functions of the aggressor center. U.S. soldiers must be turned into aggressors complete with distinctive uniform. Insignia of rank. This man is a sergeant major. Unit patches. He is in the tank corps. And even identification papers in Esperanto, the official language of the aggressor nation. If this man were captured during a maneuver, whatever he spoke would be in Esperanto. Here we have an enemy different in appearance and using an unfamiliar language. Furthermore, realism is injected into the training. Remember those aggressor tanks that our friend Lieutenant Kvieta told us had just moved into position? They have been known to fool an observer from as little as 50 yards away. Such equipment, combined with a few real tanks, gives the aggressor the appearance of a strong armored force at a fraction of the cost in men, material, and time. Light and compact, this equipment can be shipped around the country to where it's needed with a minimum of effort. A few minutes at the end of this air hose, and the limp bundle becomes a two-ton truck. Besides tanks and trucks, the aggressor pneumatic equipment also includes artillery. And speaking of artillery, here is some more aggressor equipment that adds to the realism. Sound and flash simulators. They give our forward observers a real target to look for. From a distance when the pneumatic gun position fires, it could be the real thing. And when these battle noise simulators contribute their din to the maneuver area, you have the closest thing to combat without anybody getting hurt. But suppose we let you see for yourselves exactly how effective the aggressor is. Remember that battle we witnessed earlier from the aggressor side? Well now, let's cross over the lines and see how it appeared to the other American troops engaged in this maneuver. 
The aggressor attack is expected any minute, and U.S. forces are ready. Meanwhile, overhead, an Army observation aircraft spots something new. Aggressor tank reinforcements. What unit? How many? And where did they come from? A photograph is made in the hope of finding the answers. Down on the ground, photo interpreters analyze the picture. Looks like a fresh aggressor tank company moved in overnight. The tanks may be pneumatic, but they look real. And as far as the American position in this maneuver is concerned, they are real. And the problem of meeting this tactical maneuver must be worked out as though it is a true combat situation with the lives of actual troops at stake. But the aggressor is doing some flying too, remember? Hello, boys. I have some good news for you. Free passes through our lines will soon be floating down from heaven. For you, use them. We're not really enemies, but friends. So let's get together. Come on over and see me real soon. The lessons taught in realistic combat training like this are not quickly forgotten. A moment's carelessness a short breather at the wrong time can have sudden, unforeseen results. The rules of these maneuver engagements between aggressor and American troops require the men to act in every respect as they would in actual combat. was successful in the center, but his victory was not as complete as he thought. On the flanks, the American lines held and even managed to take a few aggressor prisoners. The prisoners were taken immediately to the nearest command post where a U.S. interrogating officer was ready to go to work on them in their own language. He's a sergeant major from the Fusilier Division, sir. Q Roto, Sargento. Roto 3? He's from Company 3. That's supposed to be their reserve. Well? That may be an outfit that we got that aerial photo of this morning. STCTO, Roto 3? Where are you? Where are you? Looks like they've committed a reserve, sir. From the information gathered from aerial photos and the interrogation of aggressor prisoners, the American commanding officer decides a flanking counterattack would succeed. Combat training to be effective in maneuvers must be coordinated with realistic intelligence activities. Knowing that the aggressor forces have already committed their reserve elements, the U.S. troops push the attack to defeat their maneuver enemy.
But victory and defeat have meaning only to the extent that the participating soldiers receive combat training which familiarizes them with the conditions they may expect to meet in true battle situations. If all the men, U.S. and aggressor forces alike, have grown in combat experience, then the maneuver has been a success, and the purpose of having an aggressor force has been fulfilled. Our only function is to make training as realistic as possible, to let American soldiers experience the sensation of fighting against different soldiers with different tactics, a different language, and a different philosophy of life. And now, I think I'd better turn the big picture back to Sergeant Queen. I'm sure we all have a much better idea of just what the aggressor concept is and how it plays a major part in making American Army training more realistic and therefore much more effective. As a recent prisoner of the aggressor, I can tell you it is effective. Thank you, Captain Evans. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your Army in Action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center, Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station.